just few words to give my, my welcome to our host, Professor Amitav Ghosh. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Amitav Ghosh for accepting our invitation to participate in this meeting, which take place a few days before the ceremony for the awarding of the honorary graduation in model letters by Harvard University. It is an honor for us to be able to count among our graduates one of the greatest writers of contemporary world literature. Thanks to the colleague of the Department of Philology and Criticism of Ancient and Modern Literature, its director, Pierluigi Pellini, Professor Elena Spandri, and all the other uh, colleagues strongly involved in the organization of this meeting today. This morning meeting, with the drums of the Contrada at the district resounding on this day preceding the Palio, is an opportunity to confirm a multidisciplinary perspective that characterized the University of Siena and its commitment to studies relating to sustainability. The writing of Amitab Ghosh fits perfectly into both perspective, multidisciplinarity and sustainability. In the 2019 volume, Gun Islands, the story moves between the Sundarbans south of Calcutta, the ancient Kolkata in India, Brooklyn, and an unusual yet very real city of Venice. In these places, the rare book dealer, Dean Datta, moves, highlighting the disasters caused by climate change on the Sundarbans ecosystem, the population living between India and Bangladesh, the almost magical rules of their traditions and the consequences they cause in terms of migration to Europe. Specific and very particular places in the world that come into connection. The local between became global. Unfortunately, due to reasons related to the environmental unsustainability of our collective behaviors. Amitav Ghosh offers us a particular and very interdisciplinary perspective that connects literature, anthropology, natural sciences, and economics. It is a stimulating vision that invites each of us to reflect. This vision is also consistent with the idea that science is following a path, the journey or the voyage of science that is in the logo of the uh, public engagement initiatives in our university. For these reasons and several other reasons we will highlight this morning, I renew my thanks to our guest for his work and for his presence today in our city and in our university. Thank you to be here. Thanks a lot to the Magnifico Rettore for his opening remarks and thanks to Amitav Ghosh for being with us today. Uh, your presence at the University of Siena is a great honor and a great pleasure. Um, we are also very grateful because uh, beyond uh, giving your speech uh, on the 4th of, uh, of uh, July, in a few days, you have graciously accepted our invitation to, uh, to meet the academic community on a more informal basis. And so again, thank you very much. And now I will uh, uh, say a few words of introduction and then I leave the floor to Amitav Ghosh and to my colleagues. Uh, the main reason why the University of Siena believes it most appropriate to confer an honorary degree to Amitav Ghosh is that his work literally binds together a whole academic community. Both his fiction and non-fiction embrace an, embrace an impressive number of disciplines, which include history, sociology, anthropology, economy, medicine, biology, climatology, linguistics, and philology. 
such a richness owes much to his wide cosmopolitan education, as well as to an idea of literature as a medium most suited to engage with urgent global questions, which interrogate not only the way we look at and experience, for example, politics, ethics, and art, but also how we construct the epistemologies and methodologies of our respective fields of study. Gosh's works are unique in their ability to beautifully and originally join fieldwork, archival research, imagination, and storytelling. They address contested issues of today's world from a transnational, anti-colonial, and ecological angle. Imperial history and legacies, migrations, environmental emergencies, traumatic memories, state violence, scientific revolutions, artificial intelligence. His gripping plots and unforgettable characters have had a strong impact on a wide range of audiences, also because they are conveyed through a galaxy of different literary modes, uh, magic realism, science fiction, adventure story, historical and environmental narrative, memoir, and most recently, even poetry. Let me just remind you of some of them. Among the novels, The Shadow Lines, Le Linee d'Ombra, The Glass Palace, Il Palazzo degli Specchi, The Hungry Tide, Il Paese delle Maree, the so-called Ibis Trilogy, which includes Sea of Poppies, Mare di Papaveri, River of Smoke, Il Fiume dell'Oppio, The Flood of Fire, Diluvio di Fuoco, and finally, Gun Island, as the rector said, L'Isola dei Fucili, his most recent novel. Among the non-fiction, which is also very popular in Italy, The Great Derangement, La Grande Cecità, and The Nutmeg's Curse, La Maledizione della Noce Moscata, which is a brilliant title, I believe. Smoke and Ashes, Fumo e Cenere, his latest superb book on the hidden histories of opium, will be out in February. All Goshi's works seek and find the perfect balance between the themes addressed and the forms adopted. He is a militant artist passionately involved in anti-colonial, anti-imperialist and environmental struggles, who is nonetheless extremely vigilant not to confound means and ends and not to surrender the most important value of literature, that is its linguistic, semantic and symbolic complexity. So let's take this wonderful opportunity, okay, of his presence in Siena to engage in a dialogue with him to enlarge our comprehension of his remarkable output and, uh, and uh, just converse with him. Possiamo conversare con Amitav Ghosh, eh, sia in italiano che in inglese, eh, nel modo tradizionale, cioè alzando la mano e ponendo la domanda, tanto in italiano quanto in inglese, oppure collegandoci a un QR code, che se gentilmente, ecco, questo qui, e eh, a questo software, eh, entrando con la vostra, la vostra credenziale, con il vostro nome, eh, digitando la domanda e eh, la domanda verrà automaticamente proiettata sullo schermo. Quindi questo abbiamo pensato che fosse il modo migliore per diciamo, ehm, diciamo, eh, condividere questa mattinata eh, nel modo più eh, informale possibile, diciamo così. Eh, benissimo, io eh, mi taccio. I leave the floor to, uh, to my colleagues. Let me just introduce uh, um, my colleagues here. Professor Simone Bastianoni from the Department of Physical Science, Earth and Environment. Professor Niccolò Scaffai from the Department of Philology and Criticism. Uh, Professor Tiziana De Rogatis from the University of, For of Foreigners of Siena. Professor Simona Micali from the Department of Philology and Criticism, and Professor Armando Cutolo from the Department of Social, Political, and Cognitive Sciences. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. Yes, thanks. And uh, well, as you understood from the introduction i guess you know who is the intruder in this on this table um, 
the the, the outlier, uh, say. Uh, but uh, let me also say that after reading the nutmeg curds and the great derangement, I have to confess that my life has changed. Because many of the links of the connections that Amitav Ghosh have shown are much clearer in my mind now than after 30 years of studying uh, sustainability. Um, because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a very strange uh, beast in the, <laughs> in the, yeah, in, in the academic field. I'm an engineer by, by formation, then PhD in environmental chemistry, system psychologist. Now I, I, I teach sustainability. So I'm, my, it's, it's not exactly one, one thing. And I think this is quite helps me a lot in the sense to understand and uh, interpret uh, what Amitav Ghosh has uh, put in his books. We have for sure many points of convergence and I will try to uh, to explain how and uh, that they have uh, I mean, uh, struck me and uh, and instructed me. Uh, to start, I, I want to, to share with you uh, something that I use with my, my students. Um, and also when I have to teach sustain, what to sustainability is to people, I mean, to, to, to very young people, to people in uh, elementary school or uh, uh, in middle school. I, I show a picture of a, of a young lady with uh, the mouth filled with uh, money, with uh, paper money. And I say, have you seen someone eating money? And they say, ha, ha, ha. no, obviously not. Okay, this is the first step. What feeds you, what you use is always something coming from the environment is the environment that gives you whatever you need for your life. So the human society is fed by nature. Then the society organizes itself, makes useful things, and you, you have exchanges, commerce, trade, etc., and you have an economy as a useful output of, of the human society. We are today even more dependent on botanical matter than we were 300 years or 500 or even five millennia ago, because we are, especially because we are so many that our reliance on natural, the natural world is much, much higher than it used to be. And, and now the things uh, have changed in scale because um, everything that we decide to, to take from nature is subtracted from the availability of someone else. And this is very important with respect to before, to the 1800s or, or, or the beginning of the, 19, uh, of the 20th century when we had like 1 billion people. Now we are 8 billion uh, going towards 12 billion, and so things have changed a lot. Then we have, after this chain, environment, society, and economy, that is not something, uh, let's say, that you can, can consider each of them by itself, but it's a connection, it's a link, it's a cause-effect thing. And then there are the feedbacks. And the feedbacks are very important because you can either reinforce the chain if you feed the environment from the society and from the economy, or you can endanger this cycle if you harm the environment, for example. If you harm the, the environment, is the perfect recipe for having uh, a society that is poor 
and, 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 and the, an economy that is poor because everything cycles. And, and, this, and this is something that I really share. Uh, the, the story and, uh, that Amitav Ghosh reports in, in, in here is that students in the general ecology class were not able to identify example of positive interactions between people and the environment. And this is something that I share. <laughs> I really share because my students are more or less the same. And I have to tell them, look, if you create a park, for example, oh, yeah, this is uh, something that is useful. Or if you do something to protect, or if you are also indirectly, you install a solar panel and you shift from oil to solar. Yeah, this is something that can work. But instinctively, they are not able to identify solutions in, for which the humans can make the, uh, the environment benefit. And this is very, very striking also in my, on my, from my side. And this is also something, I mean, we can really work on a lot. And this make me feel, in, in a sense, uh, optimistic, because there is so much to do, in a sense. So it, we are not without hope, because if you, we are still at the uh, ABC of, of what can be the, the, the recipe for, for a better future, well, there is still something to do, obviously. And if, for example, at a certain point, the steam engine was very good because it could be put everywhere. So, uh, I mean, avoiding the fact that, uh, for example, uh, water power could, could be posed, obviously, only close to a, a strong river. In, in the case of, of the steam power, you, you could put, you can put everything where you like most. And these also have a, a shift. I mean, you can visualize a shift in this case because, and it's a double shift, is, uh, I mean, three posts, <laughs> maybe. Uh, when, when you pass from a concentrated form of energy to a distributed one, a distributed one for sure is more democratic. You, can, you have to put it everywhere. It's not that you can put it everywhere, but you have to put it everywhere. And in this sense, it changes the environment for sure, the society for sure, and the economy, because you don't have any more people that decide if you can have energy or not, and we need energy. And my, my first, my, my last comment is that um, when I studied systems ecology, uh, one of my mentors, uh, H.T. Odum, um, used to say, well, when you have an abundance of resources, the competition is quite a good, um, a, quite a good strategy for uh, um, success. It is, it's not a big deal. On the contrary, um, competition can make people, I mean, things better in general. But when you are in a shortage of resources, competition is basically bad for everyone that compete because it's not gonna make anyone happy at the end. Instead, cooperation that is not so good in, um, in advancing a system when you are, are in abundance of resources is the winning strategy when 
you are in a shortage of resources. And this is another hope that we have and that we, that we share. And uh, I have to say that this uh, paradigm shift is, is very, very important. And this is a uh, humans acknowledge that mutual dependence, not just on each other, but on all our relatives. And the relatives is also all the forces that come from the environment. So acceptance of such a narrative would of course require a seismic shift in consciousness. But I believe that this shift can be not gradual. It can be abrupt. It can be very, very fast. It's something that has to be fast. And so in, in this moment, I have to say that if before reading Amitav Ghosh, my, in, in, in this sense, my, my point of reference, my, my North Stars, where Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, and Pope Francis as a vision, now I have a third, that is Amitav Ghosh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting, actually. Uh, and I know exactly what you mean, uh, Professor Bastio Bastianoni, because, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> when you say that you feel that you're the outsider here, uh, because I often feel like that <laughs> ever since I started writing about these issues. In fact, last year, I got uh, an invitation to you know, the most surprising invitation I've ever received, which was to d deliver the presidential forum lecture at the American Geophysical Union, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, so it's the world's largest gathering of climate scientists, 25,000 clim climate scientists in one place in San Francisco, this was. But uh, because I didn't know what to expect, but I found that they were extraordinarily um, well disposed and welcoming of what I had to say. Which, and what I had to say was, in fact, a really strong critique of climate science, which is not because I don't accept climate science. I completely accept their, uh, uh, their uh, findings. I think the problem <coughs> really rather lies in uh, a certain kind of climate reductionism, you know, uh, which is when you, uh, you know, just let's remember right now we are seeing terrible events occurring in uh, northern Italy. Uh, in Switzerland, I mean, really horrifying um, stuff that's going on. Uh, but I think we need to remember that every time you see one of these uh, terrible rain bomb events and the awful consequences they have, uh, yes, you know, the, the climate aspect of it is important. But it's actually almost always what has been done to the terrain before, you know, the engineering of the terrain before that compounds those effects, you know. So to understand those effects, we have to understand the history, the demography, the public, uh, uh, you know, the planning of the cities. All of that is absolutely fundamental. You know, without that, just climate science can't tell you anything, uh, uh, you know, of how these events will unfold. And I do feel that uh, environmental, uh, especially environmental humanities scholars need to assert themselves. They need to insert themselves into these conversations very forcefully. Because I think just to imagine that climate scientists can tell us what's happening uh, is a terrible mistake. They can't. Uh, the second very important question, you, uh, issue that you've, uh, uh, that you've raised, something that's very important for me, is this, uh, you know, what you mentioned is a what we need really in terms of sustainability or whatever we call it is a, seism a seismic shift in consciousness. Uh, you know, to me, you know, I'm not a great believer in sustainability. I think most of the discourse around sustainability is actually just, you know, find ways of creating business as usual. But, but I think, you know, the most important aspect of sustainability as far as I'm concerned uh, is to do exactly the opposite of what universities do. <laughs> you know, uh, universities teach you universalism, you know, 
Whereas what we need at this moment is localism, particularism, because all these effects play out locally. You know, they don't play out universally. They're all, um, they're all local. And in that sense, I think Siena is a very special place in that it has preserved this localism, you know, over, uh, over eight centuries. And it's very moving for me to see that actually you have an event like the Palio, which despite being uh, many centuries old, it maintains its hold upon the imagination of young people. You know, that is, that is in itself an indication of a seismic shift in con consciousness, you know? And what's also so interesting about it is that it's it's not particular to you know it's not about sustainability as such except that it is in a, in the sense that it creates a series of connections between humans and non-humans of many different kinds you know between humans and a species like the horse but also you know with uh, other kinds of non-human and extra human and superhuman powers you know like uh, uh, yes exactly so I find that very, very interesting. And I, I think it gives us a model uh, for thinking about how, do, how we create localisms, because usually localism is considered dull, boring, you know? But here you see the way that you can give a, a sort of imaginative power to local engagements, you know, one that's capable of sustaining itself over many centuries. So I think that's something we really need to study because uh, it's increasingly disappearing from the rest of the world. It's not that those models don't exist, but these uh, universalistic models that emerge out of universities uh, uh, really destroy, you know, those imaginative structures that are able to sustain localism. So I stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, in the, the great derangement, uh, climate change and the unthinkable, Amitav Gorsh wrote that, let, let's read the quotation number one, the age of global warming defies both literary fiction and contemporary common sense. The weather events of this time have a very high degree of improbability. Indeed, it has even been proposed that this era should be named the Catastrophozoic. It is certain in any case that these are not ordinary times. The events that mark them are not easily accommodated in the deliberately prosaic world of serious prose fiction. L'era del surriscaldamento globale sfida sia l'immaginazione letteraria sia il buon senso contemporaneo. Gli eventi climatici del nostro tempo hanno un alto grado di improbabilità. Non è facile collocarli nell'universo deliberatamente prosaico della narrativa seria così nelle parole di Anna Nadotti e Norman Gobetti. Uh, so this is not to say that extreme climatic uh, events are improbable, of course, that they occur rarely. On the contrary, they are occurring more and more often, even in Italy, as Amitav Ghosh himself has rightly observed just now. And uh, besides, haven't we recently experienced an event considered highly improbable by most people, such as the global pandemic, of course. Uh, no, the, the, the question is different, as Gosh explains in this essay. Improbability concerns the, the narrative dimension. More precisely, it concerns the genre, the literary genre of the novel, in the sense that this literary form has taken on in modern European culture. In modern novel, in fact, the narrative remains, for the most part, within the boundaries of everyday life, and thus the existence of characters is shaped on them. However, in this way, the novel tradition neglects what it considers improbable, moves the unheard of toward the, the background, l'inaudito sullo sfondo, come tradotto nella, nella versione italiana, bringing everyday life to the fore. It is precisely the everyday life of the Western bourgeois that is considered worthy of being told in a serious novel. And this word serious often defines a narrative that is not fantastic or fairy tale like or science fiction, nothing against the science fiction on my part, 
But let us read the Amitabh Ghosh's words again. In the era of global warming, nothing is really far away. There is no place where the orderly expectations of bourgeois life hold unchallenged sway. It is as though our Earth had become a literary critic and were laughing at Flaubert, Chatterjee, and their life, mocking their mockery of the prodigious happenings that occur so often in romances and epic poems. Nulla è remoto nell'era del surriscaldamento globale, non c'è luogo in cui le consuete aspettative della vita borghese non siano messe in discussione, è come se la terra fosse diventata un critico letterario e se la ridesse di Flaubert, di Banchim, degli altri come loro, sbeffeggiando il loro sbeffeggiare gli eventi prodigiosi così frequenti nei romanzi popolari e nei poemi epici. Uh, so, as Amitav Ghosh uh, remarks, uh, what we call the novel is unsuitable to represent uh, uh, truly decisive uh, and urgent events, um, turning points, such as the consequences of climate change. These are events whose effects are more appreciable on a large scale, and they produce phenomena that affect the existence of entire peoples and nations, not just the everyday lives, of individuals on which the novel tends to, to focus on, uh, that kind of novel is less and less able to represent the reality of life in a, in a global world. And this limitation also affects the space and time in which novels are set. Gosh observes that the modern novel is based on a discontinuity uh, which encloses uh, events within a, a a well-defined framework. Uh, so let's read the last quotation. In novels, discontinuities of space are accompanied also by discontinuities of time. A setting usually requires a period. It is actualized within a certain time horizon. Unlike epics, which often range across eons and epochs, novels rarely extend beyond a few generations. The longue durée is not the territory of the novel. It is a through the imposition of these boundaries in time and space that the word of a novel is created, like uh, the margins of a page, these borders render places into texts so that they can be read. The romanzi, le discontinuità di spazio, sono accompagnate da discontinuità di tempo, di solito uno scenario richiede un periodo preciso, si concretizza all'interno di un determinato orizzonte eh, temporale, a differenza dell'epica, come, come osserva eh, Amitav Ghosh. Uh, however, the, 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 long durée, the long duration is necessary to understand uh, ecological relations, which are linked to the, as we have uh, just heard from uh, uh, Amitav Ghosh, which are linked to the political, economic, social, and even military history that has developed uh, over centuries on in the global world, on a global level. Gosh's reflections suggest in which direction the contemporary novel could go in order to narrate our time in this global level, on this global level. The renewal of the novel, its um, ability to, to, to understand our present in, in depth and to take a, a perspective on the future, therefore depends on elements that modern tradition has relegated the, to the epic dimension. And epic is, is often regarded as an exhausted genre, eh, un genere che ha finito di parlare eh, nella contemporaneità, ma non è così. Uh, among these elements are the improbability and the expansion of the narrated story into a larger time and space. The construction of the tale, its plot itself, correspond to the relationships between human history and the history of the environment. In his most recent books, Gosh has given novel, Gosh has given examples of, the, of, of this construction. In Ghana Island, for example, the improbable, the, the uncanny, the truth hidden at the bottom of the, of the epic tale play a very important role. Uh, the improbable, the, the, the uncanny, manifest themselves in the forms of omens, visions, possessions, 
strange encounters, coincidences that become really turning points in the, in the plot. Uh, the aim is not to tell, I think, a fantastic tale. The aim is an, instead to show how understanding a reality also requires the ability to break out the, 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 the common way of thinking, uh, to make room for other paradigms of knowledge, uh, not, the, not the Enlightenment paradigm. This is an important idea that also concerned, the cons also regarding great anthropologists, such as Ernesto de Martino, which Gosch explicitly refers to in his novel. And for example, another great uh, Italian anthropologist, Giorgio de Santillana, who had uh, a big influence on another great uh, writer, which is Italo Calvino. Through this anthropological perspective, those relationships between human and nature, or between present and past, even between Europe and Asia, can also be better understood. There are forms of causality, of, of hyper-causality, that also help to understand the historical, ideological, and political economic origins of today's environmental disasters. In Ghana Island, it's fascinating this point, uh, the etymology of words derived from the name Venice, uh, Venetia, Venetica, surprisingly expresses this, uh, this concept. So I'd like to, uh, to, to take these last remarks as starting points to ask Amitabh Ghosh some questions regarding his writing, questions falling within the perspective of literary criticism, which is my, which is my field. Uh, one first question could be uh, this one. Books such as The Great Derangement and the subsequent uh, Gun Island, The Nutmex Curse, and the, recent, the most recent one, Smoke and Ashes, have many elements in common, you know. Not only themes, including uh, evidently the ecological crisis, but also the way of connecting different times and spaces. So can we say that the writing of The Great Derangement uh, influenced your way of writing fiction? And maybe to what extent do you consider fiction and non-fiction as two different forms when, when you write, when you, when you think your books? And uh, just another one, if I, if I may. Your recent works include a, a short allegorical tale, The Living Mountain, and your experience as a, as a writer, do you think that the ancient narrative forms, uh, ancient in the sense that they precede the, the birth of the modern novel, such as epic, uh, fairy tale, uh, the apologue, can be effective in uh, narrating a, a word threatened by the climate crisis? And will you give space to this? this narrative force, narrative modes in the works you are planning now or in, uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Scafari, for, those, uh, for, for your very interesting uh, presentation. Um, you know, I should say, first, first of all, that uh, uh, you know, I was addressed as professor. <laughs> I'm not a professor, and I have not been a professor ever, really. Uh, and I, this is something I'm very proud of, <laughs> because uh, I think it's allowed me to think outside. Uh, I don't think I would have been able to do the work I've done if I had been a professor, uh, you know? Because not being a professor allows me to think in ways uh, that are not a part of, how should we say, uh, the, uh, the sort of self-obsession of the bourgeois, if you like. So uh, you raised the question of, the, uh, of um, uh, probability, improbability, uncanny omens, and fantastical tales. And your first uh, question was whether the great derangement influenced my fiction and nonfiction. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it had a very important effect upon my, th the way that I thought about my own practice, my own craft, and so on. And actually, by the time I finished writing The Great Derangement, I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? I pointed to all the problems, but um, how do I find answers? So that was when I wrote uh, Gun Island. 
And the Ghana Island, as you, you know, as you will see, it's full of omens, visions, fantastical tales, and in that sense, uh, you know, it's also connected to the second question you asked about allegorical tales and why that interests me. And that's, uh, uh, it, it's basically because I've come to be convinced that uh, serious modern, a serious modern novel uh, can never tell the story of, um, you know, what we are living through, because what we are living through is completely uncanny and improbable. And here I must say that what I find is because of these uh, improbable and uncanny events, because we can literally see the earth rising up to tell us that we are fools, you know, uh, that uh, even within the universities, there's been a, a slowly but steadily that great shift in consciousness uh, that uh, Simone uh, talked about, you know. And I'll give you just one example of that. I don't know if any of you have read uh, a book called They Flew by Carlos Eira, who's a historian at Yale University. Uh, this is a completely fascinating 800-page book, and it's on the phenomenon of levitation uh, in uh, 16th and 17th century Italy and Spain. And he's collected this enormous body of evidence to show that various saints actually levitated. Day after day, they levitated, and they couldn't be held down. Their levitation was so powerful. I'm forgetting the names of uh, the, uh, the saints, but actually there were many of them in Italy, Spain, and they were, uh, these phenomena were witnessed by thousands of people, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and uh, some of these people were, uh, you know, like kings, and um, in fact, one of them uh, was the sponsor of uh, Leibniz, you know, the German prince. He came, he was so interested in this phenomenon that he came to Italy and went to see all these saints levitating. And the saints didn't want to levitate, they hated it. You know, they complained about it, they didn't want to be seen, uh, you know, and often they were locked away in monasteries. Uh, because this was, of course, also the period of the Inquisition, so it was thought that maybe this is the devil's work. Uh, but the, the levitation continued, you know. Uh, how do we place that in the context of the uh, bourgeois novel? Have you ever read a bourgeois novel about saints levitating? <laughs> and yet there can be no doubt that these phenomena did occur, you know, unless you completely want to say that, you know, those people were just stupid and pre-enlightenment, pre but they weren't even pre-enlightenment. All of this was happening during the enlightenment, you know. So I think we have to sort of understand that only now that we are going through these uncanny experiences, that suddenly the possibility of the uncanny again becomes real. Thank you. Thanks to Professor Nicolo Scaffai, now Tiziana Derogatis. Thank you so much. Um, gathering suggestion from mm, Simone Bastianoni, Nicolo Scaffai, and of course, the great Amitav Ghosh, uh, I would like to highlight the connection between the trauma of climate change, the non-human, and the extreme emotions uh, between the great derangement, La Grande Cecità, di esse, Gosh Sesse, and the novel, The Hungry Tide, da Il Paese delle Maree. Um, the great derangement, La Grande Cecità, is focused on the unthinkable, on the trauma as something that make human beings unable to elaborate, unable to memorize, to tell, in human languages, uh, what is happening nowadays, the, the, the climate change. So uh, the great derangement, La Grande Cecità, is focused on shifting consciousness, as Gosch and Bastianoni have said now. Uh, the idea of Gosch's issue, Gosch's great uh, militant position, is to create narratives that allow human beings to absorb this enormous reality. 
uh, to create also narratives that are the voices of the nature, voices of the nature, voices that express that express itself through other languages different others than the human languages but languages that want to actually speak to human being to connect with human being about on a crisis that now cannot be really postponed anymore coming to the hungry tide which is one of the most many masterpieces of this incredible writer uh, the plot the plot of this novel, La Bassa Paese delle Maree, è un, um, is a, a transformative plot uh, in which uh, mm, the main characters are transformed by the extreme encounter with a setting, with a natural scenario. Uh, the main encounter in this natural scenario is the encounter of the tiger that you can see uh, behind my shoulder. But it's not just this, it's the Sunderban, which is this um, archipelago of islands uh, in which the tigers <laughs> is living and is at the delta of three huge, important Indian rivers and is a um, home for many natural species that are main characters actually in the novel uh, not only the tigers but also crabs are very important cro crocodiles uh, and of course uh, the dolphin because one of the main character pia is a biologist she is an indian canadian um, and she is arrived in sunderban in order to um, study the um, uh, freshwater uh, dolphin that is one of the species and then uh, the transformative experience that she is facing in these 10 days because the plot is placed in 10 days is passed throughout this incredible traumatic um, uh, intense encounter with Sandarban, but also with Fokir, a local fisherman, and then with Kanai, uh, an arrogant and wealthy translator, an Indian uh, arrogant and wealthy translator. Um, transformation is also an experience of shock, of trauma. Uh, you have chapter titled as transformation in the hungry tide but you have also chapters entitled as losses perdite and um, also uh, you have the fall la caduta la caduta uh, pia's fall in the river that is a very dangerous experience because uh, sandarban are a very dangerous place, a remote place, even if it's located just 100 kilometers far from Calcutta, and socially is a very poor place with, with a population of fishermen and families of fishermen. Uh, they are underprivileged, they are exploited, they are disherited by the Indian economy. Mm. Um, so you, you, you can see this encounter on my shoulder that is in the um, in Gosh's expression, this is in the, um, in the great arrangement, is a mutual recognition. Um, mutual recognition means at the last line of the quotation to recognize something we have turned away from. Riconoscere qualcosa a cui noi abbiamo voltato le spalle. And in another uh, quotation from the great derangement, uh, mm, rightly Gosh has underlined that to recognize is to know again, because you already knew as a human being, you were in this uh, natural scenario in which the power balance was on the nature, <laughs> on the nature front, and uh, you were, well, well, as a human being for centuries, for millennium, you were well aware of this power, uh, benign and malign at the same time, uh, an intensity, uh, we, we should say without this dualism, 
and you forgot this this uh, menace because you uh, lived in the modern era in the era of bourgeois security which is an illusion and also one should say a delusion <laughs> cioè una forma anche di delirio non solo un'illusione ma una forma di delirio alla quale siamo arrivati so to look uh, we go to the other quotation to look the um, the tiger in the eyes how how is the tiger talking with us looking at us staring at us and what should underline that this is not an idyllic encounter is a strong one is a, the basic um, way of uh, um, transform yourself in the hungry tide but mostly in the sandarban people that are looking in the eye the tigers cannot tell the other the experience because in sandarban mostly one a week a person is killed is devoured by a tiger uh, which is now coming to the idea of a nature that is transformative, but is transformed by human, because the ferocity of tiger is incredibly increased in the Sundarban because of the climate change, because the climate change comes with flood, and flood uh, uh, transforms con continuously the border of the island, and as the tiger, are, are, as, uh, as our loved pet, the cats, territorial, feline, territorial animals, they lose the traces and then become much more angry because of this. So the ferocity is natural, but is also cultural, is the Anthropocene transformation of this animal. Um, moving the eyes, the encounter with, with the tiger, coming to the other uh, quotation, uh, a very important line of imaginary in the angry tide is the spectral line. Uh, the felines, the tigers, are ghosts. They arrive silently. Uh, they mostly do not um, produce their uh, incredible sound, uh, and they uh, kill people just with, with one touch and then they devour in the silence. Um, this is the ghostly mechanism of the encounter with the tiger in the hungry tide, but every setting in the hungry tide is ghostly because you have a ghostly population which is exploited and reduced as a ghost by the neoliberal transformation in India. And you have also um, a plot, a ghost plot. You have uh, this choral transgenerational plot in which Pia Fokir Kanai comes to like uh, a call for life for people that are not there anymore, like Nirmal or Kusum. They resuscitate them throughout uh, papers, writing, um, uh, testimonianze. Uh, that, that they wrote in the other ages, because as a global novel, uh, yes, as Niccolò said, this is the force, the beauty, the extreme beauty of Gosch's writing, to create everything on the local, on the material, on the truth of something really now and typical and difficult to understand, but at the same time, um, there is this there is this connection with other places. Pia is Canadian. Uh, for example, the fisherman economy is going to die because of exploitation of corporational fish and so on. So you have this chronological, multispatial, choral, transgenerational novel. Um, comes to the other. Uh, quotation. As you can see, if we, if we talk about transformative plot, we talk about ritual processes. Uh, Hungry Tide is a ritual in the processes, is an institution rights for Pia, for Fokir, for Kanai, and for the other characters, the ghost characters that are dead and are resuscitated by, by their actions. Um, as you can see here in this quotation, um, they, they love, this is the passion between Fokir and Pia, and this, this love cannot be told in language because Fokir, Pia is uh, Indian-Canadian, she doesn't talk Bengali, whereas Fokir can, t can speak just in Bengali, which is the language uh, of um, Beng Beng the Bengal state. 
in which the, the plot is set. So they cannot really talk, but they do understand completely each other at the point that they have this adventure. Uh, Fouquier is the man that is helping this so cultured women to find the uh, dolphins with his poor boat. But they love each other uh, in an animal way. As you can see, they sat and moving like animals who had been paralyzed by the intensity of their awareness of each other. So the extreme emotions as an intensity that pass to body, from body to body, but from animal body to uh, your human body, because this is the way even Tiger is looking at human being. No? Uh, so why is it important the extreme emotion? Because the extreme emotion is the, the unique tool we have nowadays to shift our consciousness, to break our university shell and, <laughs> and to arrive at a form of truth. You have also other, of course, other uh, emotion in the hungry tide. Um, and you can see here in this other quotation that the panic, this is now Kanai experience, this is the looseness, uh, the, um, the, the fall, the losses of the arrogance, of this pride and wealthy man and cultural man that is talking many languages, six languages, but the, the panic had emptied itself of language, the panic, because Kanai is meeting with the tiger and is living also an experience of fear and panic. So this is the, the importance of the extreme emotion is to double the trauma experience, the double and to remake in a new possible way the trauma experience because this kind of extreme emotion are the tool for the transformative plot for the initiation right and another emotion the last one uh, is uh, anger is again canai that lost his control of a cultured man with fokir and uh, the anger is comes in the form not empty emptiness this is not the emptiness of language but this is the distortion of language the language used to uh, lose our control of bourgeois Indian man, of cultured man. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see here uh, how important is the question of languages for, um, for, for, for Grosch. And now comes my questions, because um, this, the centralizing, this, 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 all this imaginary is not focused on the idea of destroying human languages, of course. But the focus is on the centralizing language. Mm? The centralizing language means decentralize any form of ethnocentrism, human colonialism. That means, most simply, without all these abstract categories that are not helping us nowadays, to destroy the forms of vertical power because this is colonialism, is any dynamic of vertical power that we can have in any form of relationship, unfortunately. Every human capacity can become a power, and is a vertical one. One becomes over, is, is on another one, and is up because you are down, because you are down. This is a hierarchical idea of manage the world that human beings express. Um, so, not destroy the language, but decentralizing the language. And that comes my question about storytelling. How is important for Amitav Ghosh the storytelling uh, as a way to rewrite the languages, uh, to make space for uh, natural languages, like the encounter with tigers, scraps, crocodile, uh, how these languages are talking with Fokir, Pia, and Kanai and all the other characters, but also the struggle between human languages. Uh, in uh, The Hungry Tide, you have a scientific language that is a power language, the colonialistic language that is struggling. They want to dominate the mythical language of the bomb legend, that is the mythical legend. So you will find 
uh, every chapter, every, every paragraph, an effort, a strength to uh, rewrite these languages, not in order to create another hierarchy, but in order to create a tissue, a storytelling in which materials can intertwine, can be mixed, can be contaminated, can really talk to our emotions. So uh, how is this idea of storytelling that we can really experience reading one of your masterpieces such as uh, The Hungry Tide? Um, from which comes this idea of storytelling and how much is connected to um, the, the, the struggle between uh, contemporary poetics, for example, your idea of working on a realism that is sabotaging itself of, as a realism, because at the same time you have a realism, but the magical realism, for example, here, in, again, in the, uh, this last quotation, the panic, the panic becomes a totem, is totemized. He has not language in order to express the panic, so the panic is a totem, that becomes a totem that, to that is totemizing the reality of the thing itself from which becomes the panic, the tiger, no? So this is, as you can see, a moment in which the uh, just apparent realism, the transparency of realism is a sabotage in which Gosh is injecting surrealism, anthropology imaginary, uh, an incredibly huge quantity of materials that comes from life. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, for your very interesting questions, and especially on these issues of um, uh, uh, language and linguistic uh, uh, communication. Uh, the Hungry Tide, it's so, uh, it's so interesting to hear you talking about The Hungry Tide, because it's a book I wrote a long time ago, uh, 20 years ago it was published. But I first started researching the book uh, in the year 2000, and... Uh, I, you know that book played a very crucial role in my uh, in my development because it was when I started uh, researching the hungry tide that I became aware of climate change. Uh, you know because in the Sundarban you could see the effects of climate change uh, twenty years ago. You know you could see it uh, the effects of sea level rise and you know many other uh, many other impacts. And that's, uh, you know, when I started thinking about uh, uh, many of these issues, how to decenter, uh, uh, most of all the question of human and uh, non-human communication. Because it seems to me that from a writer's point of view, uh, the most important thing, challenge that faces us today is the question of how to give expression to non-humans you know, non-humans of many different kinds. And of course, this is something that writers historically always did. You know, they talked about only actually in the field of literature, could you ask questions about non-human agency, non-human communication? And this is something that many uh, writers have done uh, uh, so well. I mean, if you think of a story like Pinocchio, it's really all about non-human agency. You know, how objects of many kinds uh, come to take life and, you know, how they interact uh, uh, with each other. So, you know, I think this question of how to give voice to non-humans, uh, you know, it's a very difficult question because it, most of all for those of us who are trained in or who's, who are interested in language and philology and so on, because uh, if you think of, say, Davi Kopenawa, who I'm sure many of you will have heard of, he's a Yanomami shaman. And he, uh, he visits Italy quite regularly, I think. I mean, I, uh, in Torino, two or three years ago, he was there, I remember. I missed, uh, I missed meeting him, unfortunately. Uh, but he's written a book called The Falling Sky. And he was actually an initiated Yanomami shaman. And he wrote this book in uh, collaboration with a French anthropologist called Albert Bruce. And what he says 
is that what prevents those of us who are literate from understanding non-human voices is precisely that we are literate, you know? That those who are literate simply cannot understand all the other voices that are out there in the world because it's this thing, literacy, that came to separate us from non-human languages. Uh, so it's a very interesting perspective uh, for those of us whose entire lives and imaginations are completely tied up uh, with language and the history of languages. Because also, really, it's something, again, that we need to ask ourselves. Because if you look at mystical traditions of every kind, whether it be Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, uh, what they always say is that true understanding begins uh, at the at the limits of language, you know. So, uh, how do you uh, contend with that when you are dealing with a form like literature, which is all about language? Thank you. Thank you, Tiziana. Derogatis, I'm Simona Micali, and I'm um, a scholar of uh, literary studies, comparative literature, but especially science fiction and environmental humanities, so the, you know, the surroundings of mainstream serious literature. And as such, I'm very honored and grateful to have a chance to uh, speak with one of the most brilliant figures of both uh, literature, uh, fiction, uh, but also environmental criticism. So I, I'd like to, to use most of my time not to speak, but to hear your voice, both through um, your books, uh, your, uh, the quotes from your books, uh, and uh, the questions arising from uh, these quotes from your books. So if I, if I have the time, I will ask you two questions instead of one. Let's see if I can. So, um, I will start from a motto with, which is very popular among scholars of environmental humanities, a motto which was formulated by Frederick Jameson, then relaunched by Slavoj Žižek, and then popularized by Mark Fisher, which is, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And then it's been also, um, uh, reused to say it's easier to imagine the end of the world and the end of colonialism, imperialism, extractivism, and so on and so forth. Um, which is more or less the idea uh, Simone was um, uh, reflecting on. The, the kids are not able to think of solutions. But in reading your books, and especially in watching kids like my daughter, who is now 14, protesting in the Fridays for Future uh, movements or for peace in Palestine, I'm wondering if the the is it really so? I mean, the, the, the apocalyptic preaching of scholars and writers is not in itself a product of a lack of imagination. And uh, so my first quote concerns precisely the power of imagination and the idea uh, that uh, it is a powerful, imagination is a powerful tool to understand reality more than supposed objective reports, and this is one of the main themes of one of your first novels, The Shadow Lines, a narrative in which interweaves different memories of different people and characters, and the most peculiar of them is the narrator's cousin, Tridib, who loves to tell stories that might be considered lies, but maybe are not lies, and just peculiar ways of seeing the world. And so the narrator reflects, and still I knew that the sights Tridib saw in his imagination were infinitely more detailed, more precise than anything I would ever see. He said to me once that one could never know anything except through desire, real desire, which was not the same thing as greed or lust, a pure, painful and primitive desire, a longing for everything that was not in oneself, a torment of the flesh that carried one beyond the limits of one, one's mind to other times and other places and even if one was lucky into a place where there was no border between oneself and one's image at, in the mirror. I listened to him bewildered, wondering whether I would ever know anything at all, for I was not sure whether I would ever experience desire of that kind. So the connection between desire and imagination is particularly enlightening, I think. It makes me think that the cultural crisis we're going through is properly deriving uh, 
from a lack of desire and especially a lack of empathy, uh, which is the ability of putting yourself in other people's shoes, in other people's lives. And this is what literature is, is supposed to train us to do. I mean, to train the reader's imaginative faculty and training our ability to put ourselves in other, uh, other people's shoes. Um, but as, as you know, you, you made very clear, you pointed out very brilliantly, uh, it, really uh, literature is not helping to understand what is going on in the world. And the second quote, I think I can safely skip it because uh, it was something that my colleague uh, Nicolò pointed out very well, uh, your uh, reflection in the great arrangement uh, uh, about the inability of literature to deal with the world as it is going now. But I wanted to, um, to stop a moment uh, on uh, uh, a very interesting point uh, you clarified uh, still uh, in the great derangement. Uh, um, an intriguing reflection of when and how the fields of serious fiction, mainstream fiction, and speculative fiction were separated at what you brilliantly defined the branding of science fiction. Uh, just one more. How then did the provinces of the imaginative and the scientific come to be so sharply divided from each other? According to Latour, the project of partitioning is supposed always to be a related enterprise, one that he describes as purification, the purpose of which is to ensure that nature remains off limits to culture, the knowledge of which is consigned entirely to the science. This entails the marking off and the suppression of the hybrids, and that, of course, is exactly the story of the branding of science fiction as a genre separate from the literary mainstream. The line that has been drawn between them exists only for the sake of the neatness, because the zeitgeist of late modernity could not tolerate nature-culture hybrids. Nor is this a pattern likely to change soon. I think it can be safely predicted that as the waters rise around us, the mention of serious fiction like doom waterfront properties of Mumbai and Miami Beach will double down on its current sense of itself, building even higher barricades to keep the waves at bay. So my point is, do you think that these last years have maybe after you wrote a great arrangement, uh, something is changing, uh, because more and more writers, uh, mainstream writers, uh, uh, give in to the temptation of speculation and thinking of, you know, Katsu Ishiguro with Never Let Me Go, McCarthy with Roth, Philip Roth with The Plot Against America, McEwan with Machines Like Me or Danilo with Science. And I also think it's significant that many of these fictional experiments, speculative exper experiments are in the genre of, the subgenre of alternative history. Which, which seems to be a particularly effective way of using science fiction as a tool to understand the past, not just the future, but also the past, to grasp the future in the past, as you said in a beautiful interview you gave last year in Pistoia. So what do you think? Is something changing or not? Thank you very much. Uh, well, you know, uh, I've written uh, I've written novels which are considered science fiction, like my book, uh, The Calcutta Chromosome. And science fiction is something that I've always uh, been interested in, in one way or another. Um, so, you know, the interesting thing about science fiction and what's now called serious fiction is that if you think of what was called serious fiction in the late 20th century, you know, when I was coming of age and so on, and if you think of the science fiction that was written then, the serious fiction writers, the people who were considered serious fiction, are completely forgotten, <laughs> you know? I mean, if you think of someone like a writer, like, let's say, Angus Wilson, you know? I, I'm, most of you will not even have heard of him, uh, you know? Uh, but, uh, I mean, who reads Angus Wilson? Even other uh, sort of well-known uh, 
American and British writers of that time, when we look back, when we look at their work today, it just seems so dated and so uninteresting, like Updike, who got almost everything wrong, you know, about the world and about the future. But at the, at the time, he was like completely dominant in American letters. But at the same time, if you consider someone like Ursula Le Guin, you know, her work has just grown and grown and grown in importance. And her work at that time was always uh, sort of uh, regarded as um, marginal, you know, because it was science fiction and so on. Uh, and yet, so I think really, in a sense, that whole idea of seriousness, just as I said in The Great Derangement, is actually really crumbling, you know, in, its, um, in what we uh, consider important. But I can also say that the second part of this um, uh, this uh, uh, quote is true that building ever higher barricades to keep away, you know, what is happening around you is also happening. We can see that because if you look at, you know, the books that win prizes and so on to this day, uh, it's really, I mean, they continue to be, you know, books about identity, sexuality and so on. Uh, Richard Powers' book, uh, uh, Overstory, is one great exception and I think that's a very a meaningful and positive exception. But other than that, I think, um, uh, you know, it's curious. I see many writers, uh, you know, many writers who teach uh, creative writing. Many of them are very interested and involved uh, in issues of climate, environment, and so on. And yet they continue to tell their students that unless you write about identity, no one will read your books. You know, which is, <laughs> which seems really uh, so sad and so self-defeating. So I think at this point we are really at a stage where, in a sense, all our ideas about what constitutes literature, what constitutes serious writing, uh, all of that is crumbling, and and we just don't know uh, what will replace them. We are really exactly, uh, you know, at that position. Uh, where you see, uh, you know, one reality crumbling and the other one waiting to be born, and in between there's a period of uh, monstrousness. <laughs> uh, that's Gramsci. Yes, exactly, Gramsci. <laughs> yes. Uh, still about the relationship between uh, mainstream and genre, uh, realistic, unrealistic, plausible, unplausible, but from a different perspective. Um, while reading The Great Derangement, uh, I was uh, reflecting on the fact that uh, what you're speaking about is mainly the great Western tradition of the novel. And this led me to think of the perspective of world literature as a system organized by center and suburbs, uh, you know, the, the great center, which is Europe and the Western tradition and the suburbs, which is the, the, the colonized countries, literature, and then the post-colonial perspective. Uh, not surprisingly, you also mentioned as possible sources from this different, for, for a different vision of the relationship between uh, human and non-human, uh, the people and uh, um, living beings and environment and so on and so forth. Uh, magical uh, realism, uh, the epic, uh, and other literary forms that subvert and reject uh, the Western uh, literary models based on the plausible, the special, and temporal uh, discontinuity and individual hero. And I also had the, the, the impression that your last, uh, your latest works of fictions, like Jungle Nama, for instance, try to uh, recover these different traditions, uh, um, non-Western tradition, and maybe, you know, making a hybrids between the Western and the non-Western tradition uh, with the recovery of the orality, the collective storytelling, but also the relationship between uh, verse and prose, uh, uh, text and image and so on. And uh, in this perspective, I, my, I wanted to use as a last quote, uh, a very beautiful uh, uh, quote uh, of uh, the Living Mountain, which is uh, not only a beautiful and very readable text, but also has beautiful uh, illustrations uh, in it by um, Devangana Dash. And now suddenly everything changed. 
hordes of the anthropoi, the, the Western people, you know, the real men, came running towards us, crying out in despair, just as we had done for so long. Brought together by a shared foreboding, we joined hands and embraced. No longer we were anthropoi and barbaroi, we were one. Maybe, said their servants, there was some wisdom in your beliefs, after all. Can you please tell us your old stories, sing us your old songs, show us your dances, so that we can determine whether your mountain really is alive or not? But to our dismay, we found out that we had forgotten the old stories and songs and dances. We too had come to believe that they were foolish and fantastical and had no place in the age of the Anthropoi. And so began a frantic search for someone, anyone, who remembered anything at all about the old days. So I guess my question is, um, how do you see it? I mean, th this model with the center, which is the West and the great Western tradition, and then the provinces, which has to you know, uh, incorporate these models and reproduce them. Is it still working or something is changed? Are we really getting in a new world system in which different perspectives and voices and traditions are coming together? And, you know, the crucial question, how do you position yourself? Do you feel like a world writer or, a, uh, you know, a world writer in English language? or a hybrid figure, or an Indian writer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, this question of world literature and post-colonial and so on, uh, you know, I have to say that I don't think about those things at all. Because, uh, I mean, those are things that critics think about. Uh, if I started thinking, am I, well, am I, do I write <laughs> about uh, world literature, or am I post-colonial? <laughs> I mean, how would I know? I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's even a productive question for me. Because, uh, you know, you take uh, the platypus, <laughs> you know, the platypus is neither a mammal nor quite uh, something else. But does that question worry the platypus? <laughs> I don't think so. The platypus just carries on. And in that sense, I think I'm like a platypus, you know, I just go on as best I can. But this question of magical realism uh, is a very interesting one, though. Um, uh, I actually knew Gregory Rabasso, you know, who translated uh, 100 Years of Solitude, and he translated a lot of the work of uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And he always used to say that uh, you mustn't imagine that Marquez's writing comes out of some, um, you know, oral tradition or anything like that. Marquez is absolutely fundamentally founded in the Western tradition, you know. And uh, uh, it's interesting that magical realism, especially the sort of magical realism that came out of Latin America, when they talk about magic, uh, the magic is almost completely always anthropocentric. You know, it's about uh, magical things happening to humans. Uh, it's never about, uh, uh, you know, human non human uh, connections. And I think that's a very important distinction to make there. Um, so, uh, you know, there again, we have something very important uh, to contend with. I mean, over here, uh, if this passage, uh, we too had come to believe they were foolish and fantastical and so on. And uh, uh, their savant saying, maybe there was some wisdom in your beliefs after all. I was really thinking of what's now called traditional ecological knowledge. So you have whole within, uh, you know, ecological and sustainability studies. Suddenly people have realized that actually, you know, indigenous peoples everywhere, they had a more sustainable relationship with forests and seas and rivers than we do. So they want to reintroduce a certain, let's say, practices of burning the forest and so on. But the problem is uh, that for, uh, for the last 200 years, let's say in America, the Americans have been persecuting indigenous uh, knowledge leaders 
for so long. I mean, just persecuting, uh, suppressing with a almost unimaginable violence, you know, trying to root out their languages, root out their practices. I mean, can you imagine the US is uh, uh, alleged to be founded on principles of religious equality, but in 1885, they banned traditional Native American religious practices. And it wasn't until 1976 that they were allowed to start those practices again. So for almost 100 years, they did everything possible to eradicate this kind of knowledge. Um, you know, so people often don't remember. And even today, we see this arising uh, repeatedly uh, in, in India, for example. So uh, in India, especially in certain parts of central India, Chhattisgarh and so on, uh, there are now very strong indigenous movements. But just the other day, I was in Paris and I went to uh, hear Alpa Shah, who's an anthropologist who's written about these movements. And she showed, uh, she said that these uh, radicals who are really doing a lot to represent indigenous peoples, they have, they, it's one of their sort of uh, credos, they respect indigenous knowledge but they don't accept indigenous ontologies. Now, that's really puzzling to me. How do you respect indigenous knowledge if you don't, uh, if you don't accept indigenous ontologies? I mean, how is that even possible? What, what does it mean? So uh, even today, you see exactly this. I mean, even indigenous groups are themselves auto-colonizing, you know? And this is what we see most of all in India. You know, there's a huge attack upon indigenous knowledge systems from the outside world, of course, where they're completely repeating uh, what was done in America. Children are being taken away from tribes and being put into these boarding schools where they're being educated into so-called Hinduism and they're being taught that their own beliefs are all nonsense and so on. So, you know, what can I say? I mean, everything you see in the world uh, just seems <laughs> more and more depressing, <laughs> really. And um, I'm also like the first colleague who has spoken, a kind of an kind of a intruder here, because I'm an anthropologist. I'm not into literary studies, but when Elena Spandri first invited me to join this uh, roundtable, I was I felt I was very happy, very honoured to have the possibility to get to know Amit Avgosh. But uh, quite a well, quite soon, I felt a bit worried, a bit puzzled. What should I have said about uh, um, your huge work, <laughs> production, literary production, centering my, my speak on anthropology? And um, so I started to think to your work and reread some of the things I had read in the past. And, um, and I, couldn't be, uh, I could not help but think that even as a writer, Mm. Even as a writer of a novel, uh, you have practiced without explicitly formulating it. Uh, uh, what I would call a militant or public anthropology in the in the contemporary sense of the word, that means a, 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 an anthropology that speaks out uh, in the public sp in the public space. No, um, disseminated in your novels and essay, uh, your anthropology has spoken out bringing to light the historical links, let's say, uh, connecting the climate crisis to the violent predatory relations that capitalism has established on the one hand with the planet, with our planet, and on the other hand with societies that it has conquered and subjected during its, during its expansion, uh, as we can read very well in the Ibis trilogy, for instance, or in the, the Nutmeg course cool. yes and um so what uh, so I, I i try to say uh, something about your uh, let's say implicit anthropology militant implicit anthropology from a distance uh, and I, I it could be said that um, uh, this is an anthropology of global and and local and his connection historical connection and genealogy genealogies that illuminates the intertwinings of imperialism and capitalism. And this intertwining, in turn, highlights 
the ecological and clim climatic consequences in what I would like to define as a pro progressive, a looking forward critique of modernity. And um, the connection and the genealogy that you draw in your books disrupt trajectories, hegemonic historical na narratives, and divert the era of, of time of historicism. Of course, the idea of progress that we still find today, this, despite the supposed end of the grand narratives, uh, in the rhetorics of development, growth, and so on. No? The question of, they question, I would say, the teleology of modernity that the historian Dipesh Chakrabarti summarized with the phrase, first in Europe, then in the rest of the world. Uh, indeed, uh, what seems to me as a significant element of convergence between your stance, let's say, and post-colonial studies or subalternist historians is that, um, is the, let's say, the, um, the awareness that the rest of the world, what Ch Chakrabarti uh, calls the rest of the world, I mean, in your case, Asia, uh, South Asia, has participated from the beginning to the construction of modernity. But it has participated with a role defined within the framework of the colonial apparatus, uh, the, subordinate, the subordinate role of the colonized. Now, if we think within this um, framework, within, within this uh, yeah, frame, um, um, to the, um, let's say, to the delay, for instance, of the Indian contribution to global warming, uh, the idea of a credit and of a recovery uh, in CO2 ignitions shows itself to be extremely problematic because rather than a recovering by proceeding along the same path, uh, we should recognize the constitutive violence of this trajectory and abandon it. And in other words, it is about questioning the line of the historical temporality. Uh, established with imperialism and in the Indian subcontinent, not traversing it faster to make, to make up for lost time. Mm? Moreover, we should be aware that, and your, uh, um, lead, your work make us aware that colonial and genocidal violence um, is never definitely behind us, no? In fact, we observe them today in Gaza, in Palestine, where the craters opened by Israeli bombs are swallowing every remaining uh, legitimacy of the day of a progressive time, you know, a progressive telos of modernity. Uh, I would like to take advantage for this, uh, for me, quite extraordinary op opportunity to engage with, with the Amitav Ghosh, uh, to, to hear him, for, to him, for him, for hearing speaking about an issue that I find very important as an anthropologist on, on the one side and as a citizen of the global warming, let's say, on the other. Uh, it has to do with a very acute analysis in, that in the great derangement connects the novel, the modern novel, with the modern notion of the self on the one side and with climate crisis on the other. I'll try to explain myself as, as best as I can. Uh, in that book, a contradiction that stands at the center of contemporary times emerges in various points. Uh, I'm referring to the contradiction that opposes the figure of the modern individual uh, understood as a moral subject defined and valued by his autonomy, his choices and so on. And, uh, uh, and the recognition on the other side of the constitutively common anti-individualist dimension, dimension within which we must think about environmental politics. I recall the pleasure with which I read the pages of The Great Derangement, where the author, with you, <laughs> you express your distrust of the liberal moral ideology that centers or charges, if you want, the responsibility for the crisis on the individual. Mm? Uh, uh, you have deconstructed very well in some pages of the book the false consciousness of those who try to corner environmentalism by leveraging the contradictions and the inconsistence that inevitably 
appear in the lives of those who live in a capitalist world. Hmm? There is all of us. There is all of us, even the most militant. Making in this way everyone guilty is an excellent way to paralyze imagination, to paralyze any imagination and any counter-hegemonic and transformative initiative, leaving us on just one space, no? Our actions are consumers, no? Choosing a biological product or another. Hmm? While, we are, while, while we are all guilty. Now, uh, your critique seems to me the, to question the individualistic episteme uh, that is at the heart of modernity and capitalism. It highlights the ideological connection that on the one hand go towards a modern conception of the goat subject and on the other re hand, on the other hand sorry lead to the modern representation of what is being segregated into the category of nature hmm? segregated and put at distance in fact uh, if you if you will anthropology has worked a lot on the opposition nature and culture in the 20th century but i think you stand in the new ontological turn where where the opposition be, between nature and culture is you know um behind our backs already through the scolavi veros de castro uh, eduardo con that you quote somewhere in uh, in uh, i think in the, in the great range derangement yes yes and uh, uh, although, even though I'm not a literary critic, <laughs> I would like to enter uh, the, um, a, a question. Um, in that book, uh, The Great Derangement, you um, read the conception of the novel proposed by John Updike. Hmm? Uh, Updike understands it as a narrative of an individual moral adventure, hmm? a definition which you, that you do, do not reject as such, but, but you explore in its implications. Uh, in fact, the question of the narratives of the truth of the subject, as Michel Foucault used to call it, often addressed by, so I've been, let's say, addressed a lot by literary critics and human sciences in the 20th centuries, but it has a much less analyzed corollary implication that of a complementary narrative of nature as a still life hmm? mm -hmm. uh, i don't know if still life in, in this case is the good uh term because i i i, I read the the great <laughs> derangement in italian unluckily so i don't know nature morte oh voila uh, i don't know if you re wrote uh, still life in uh, i don't think so in in english nature morte. so it was in french okay I will always ask myself <laughs> whether that. So, uh, the narrative of nature as a nature morte, that is, as the realm of uniform and mute processes. The story starts with Charles Lyell, uh, uh, the geologist in uh, the 19th century. Um, and this makes of the climate crisis, which produces historical ev event, events terrible meanings and dramatic change, a deranging, disquieting object to deal with for a novelist. Uh, so your um, work constructs an anthropological, uh, for me in the best sense of the word, a critique of the imperial and individualistic episteme that modernity has made hegemonic and naturalized. Uh, he, and um, this anthropology proposed a critique that not only denaturalizes the development of capitalism by exposing its violent genealogy, but also make, uh, makes us aware of the historicity and of the agentive role of nature. So denaturalizing capitalism and giving historicity to nature, no, the, the two opposed but complementary movement that I find in your anthropology. And, uh, um, and my question is very simple. No, in fact, it's very complicated, but uh, uh, it might be. <laughs> your, um, let's just start. Yeah, both of them. You, you, can, you can go in both directions. You can go in both directions. <laughs> it doesn't change. So, um, um, yeah, about the individual moral adventure. Uh, it could be observed 
no, observed, however, that this kind of narrative no, concerning the truth of the subject, I'm, I'm quoting once again Michel Foucault, uh, with which modernity seems to be obsessed, has opened a in, in, in the, what the hell is going on? Sorry, this is my <laughs> terrible, terrible, I, I was sure. I, uh, anyway, uh, and but um, the the individual more the narratives of the moral individual adve adventure has um, provided a space hmm, for dissent, hmm, for critique uh, within literature. Uh, and how, how could we abandon really the uh, moral subject, individual moral subject, and its capacity, you know? to criticize uh, the, the world, the social order, for instance, who is in. Mm? Uh, I think you've done it in, uh, in some way, in, your, in many ways, I would say, in your books, but I, I would like to hear you more uh, on that topic, if it's possible, if you, if you like to. So. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, well, uh, uh, let's start with this whole question of the uh, novel as uh, being the individual moral adventure, which was uh, actually Updike's characterization. I mean, I think Updike is just clearly wrong. I mean, he's not even reading his own uh, uh, American literary tradition with any care. Uh, because, you know, one of the most important books of the 20th century, uh, far more important than anything that Updike had, had, has written, uh, was uh, uh, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. And The Grapes of Wrath is, in, it, uh, in every way, in my opinion, uh, a book about uh, a changing climate. Uh, you know, and in fact, the first, uh, the first chapter of this book is absolutely, it's a, it's a wonderful piece of writing about, uh, you know, enormous environmental change, which forces his characters into movement. So for me, Grapes of Wrath is very much a book about climate, which is uh, avant la lettre. You know, it's a very powerful book, a very important book, but it's in no sense an individual moral adventure. You know, you're talking about a, a collectivity moving, taking its language with it, because uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the book, very little of it is actually narrative. Mainly, it's long chunks of uh, con uh, of conversation or dialogue. I mean, almost all his narration happens through uh, through dialogue, uh, in which he is trying to. And this is very interesting to those of us who are interested in philology, in which he's trying to sort of recreate an Oklahoma dialect, or what he thinks of as an Oklahoma dialect. But the curious thing is that if you consider this as a kind of model for the possibilities of writing about one of the most important phenomena that's, um, you know, that's the outcome of climate change is mass migration. You know, but if you were to try to write about uh, the migrants who are being forced to move, uh, even in America today, uh, they wouldn't be speaking English at all. Uh, they would be speaking Spanish, you know. So, in a way, it falls outside, as it were, the naturalistic boundaries of a certain kind of narrative. You know, or you, or you take uh, Knut Hampson, uh, you know, um, a Swedish writer from long, a Norwegian writer from long ago, who wrote about particular environments, uh, especially northern environments. But again, if you were to try to write uh, like Knut Hampson today, you couldn't because he relies on, uh, you know, as a lot of environmental writers once did, they relied a lot on local dialects, you know. Uh, but today, if you go to northern uh, Norway, uh, you'll find that it's now populated by large uh, immigrant communities from Syria, from Kurdistan, from uh, many different places. And in fact, even uh, northern Norwegians don't speak dialect anymore. They speak standard uh, Norwegian, uh, you know, which is taught to them in schools. I mean, just think how quickly you've lost dialects in, uh, in Italy. I mean, recently, uh, you know, I did a, a thing at the University of Torino, uh, and I think there were like about 30 people in one class, and I asked them uh, how many of them actually spoke a dialect, and not even five uh, raised their hands. You know, I mean, uh, so that standard form of, uh, how many people here speak a dialect? See, it's a tiny minority. 
it's a tiny minority. Uh, I mean, uh, and most of those who speak, I, I, I seem to notice that uh, were not the younger people, but the older people, uh, you know, so it's very striking how quick, because, you know, 30, 40 years ago, everyone in Italy spoke some dialect, but now they don't. So even in terms of, um, you know, using dialect to represent uh, particularity or localism is, is, uh, is literally gone. So uh, the, the whole question of the uh, individual moral adventure, I think, is, uh, is very questionable. Certainly, we know today that this whole idea that you can solve, solve climate change uh, by making individual choices. I mean, I don't even need to debunk that. We know how, how absurd this idea is. So um, what can I say? I mean, I, uh, at the same time, I see that people are completely stuck within that, uh, that framework because uh, energy corporations have spent billions of dollars promoting this idea that uh, individual choices can reform, uh, can change, uh, uh, you know, the environment. But uh, you, we have to remember that this is a very old uh, tactic of capitalism. So, for example, one of the earliest capitalist enterprises arises out of the intersection of capitalism and imperialism, uh, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the commerce in opioids, you know, which is sponsored by the Dutch Empire, the, the, uh, the British Empire, the French Empire. And when people started trying to resist, uh, you know, this imperial um, uh, opium trade, uh, the answer for um, provided by the British and so on was that this is a problem of individual desires. You know, people want to use opium, so how can you stop it? And in fact, um, you know, the Qing Empire said it's nothing of the kind. It's um, it's because you're providing this good that people want to uh, that people want to use it. So you know this is uh, this is a this is a playbook that has a very long history. It it was used by the tobacco companies, and now it's been adopted almost completely by fossil fuel companies. So. Thank you. So thank you very much to Amitav Ghosh and to all the speakers for having so beautifully enlivened in this conversation. E adesso penso che sia arrivato il momento di aprire eh, la conversazione alla platea. Uh, well, let me try to answer Gian Maria's question first. Uh, what are the most effective narrative techniques to deal with the ecological crisis in fiction? You know, I don't think we should, um, we should approach these issues out of a question of, out of a perspective of effectivity. You know, because that would imply that writers are essentially trying to do a certain kind of propaganda, you know, uh, and I don't think good writing comes out of that mindset, you know. Uh, it simply doesn't work. I mean, uh, how can I, through fiction, try to persuade people of something that they should do where or an enormous body of scientific and techn technological knowledge already exists? and people are not uh, taking that path. So is it even realistic to think of uh, uh, fictional techniques, uh, you know, being effective in that sense? I, I just don't think it's realistic. Thank you. Uh, languages in literature. What is your relationship with languages, including English, and why use various languages in your books? How do colonial authors like Corrad and Kipling influence your work? This is a sort of summary of different questions. Uh, well, I come from a very multilingual uh, circumstance. You know, this is, uh, this is normal in India. We all grow up, uh, you know, speaking one language at home, one language outside, and many other languages. And, uh, you know, the interplay of languages is something that's very important to me. So, uh, you know, my mother tongue, so-called, uh, is Bengali, but I learned uh, English at a very early age. I've been writing in English. I, un I also read and understand, uh, you know, Hindi and uh, several other languages. But 
you know, uh, in that context, I would say that uh, learning Italian has been a very important part of my uh, linguistic education because, uh, you know, until then, my exposure to Western culture, as is true of most of us uh, in India, was exclusively anglophonic, you know. And I think uh, Italian has a very different perspective. And learning Italian uh, has really opened a, a different window, if you like, on Western culture for me. Migration due to climate change often connects with certain geopolitical issues. How do you think the geopolitical landscape will be influenced by the movements of climate migrants? Are there important geopolitical challenges happening now? Uh, very good question. I have to say that uh, straight away that the, the main difference between my view of climate change uh, uh, and other especially technological and uh, scientific views of climate change uh, is that I don't think that climate change is fundamentally a techno-scientific uh, uh, challenge. I don't even think that climate change uh, is the right, uh, is the right uh, frame for what we are facing today. Because as, uh, as we've often heard, uh, you know, really, it's not just climate change, it's everything change. You know, we are seeing around us a world where everything is changing very, very fast. Uh, so we're seeing, say, the crisis of biodiversity loss, the crisis of extinctions. We are seeing so many other forms of, uh, so many other crises occurring, uh, unfolding simultaneously. But most of all, I think of uh, climate change as fundamentally a geopolitical issue. And when I say geopolitical issue, I mean this goes back uh, really to uh, the geopolitics of the last 500 years. 500 years ago, Europe began to expand into the world when it, uh, you know, uh, at an accelerating rate. So from about 300 years ago, from the time of the birth uh, of, uh, you know, of um, uh, the use of steam technology, which is based on fossil fuels. Uh, that starts in the late uh, 18th century, and that enormously accelerates Europe's ability to subjugate the world. And it was at that time, let's say in the early 19th century in India, when uh, you know this entire uh, uh, the system of uh, power based upon fossil fuels arises, in fact, uh, indigenous in, uh, Indian entrepreneurs were very keen to adopt a fossil fuel technology, but the British event, uh, actually used their power to prevent them. So it's not until uh, decolonization that we see it, that it becomes possible for the majority population of the world to actually adopt uh, this uh, carbon intensive economy. So it's precisely in the period of decolonization that you suddenly see that the whole world becomes uh, invested in carbon intensive technologies, and which is one of the reasons why uh, today, I mean, let's face it, Europe is increasingly irrelevant to the world. Uh, but the, the collective West now has become uh, essentially centered upon the United States. And almost all United States policies today uh, in one way or the other centered upon fossil fuels, you know, fossil fuel technologies, the availability of fossil fuels. And that's where we see the real, the real disaster that is approaching us today. Because what we see is the greatest change in uh, global geopolitics for the last 500 years, where essentially the collective West is becoming less and less important but the collective West is not going to give this up without a fight. And that's what we see uh, um, unfolding in Ukraine today. It's what we see unfolding in, uh, in Palestine today. I mean, we shouldn't imagine that these are local conflicts. They're not. I mean, these conflicts are fundamentally a change in global geopolitics. And as we can see, this is the greatest blow to anyone who thinks that uh, the climate crisis can be fixed by technological solutions. You see, over the last two years, since 2022 and the outbreak of the Ukraine war, 
uh, that uh, the collective West has uh, maybe committed a couple of hundred billion dollars to climate change mitigation, though the money isn't actually there, it hasn't been paid up, it's just notional verbal kind of commitments. At the same time, they've increased their defense spending by trillions. You know, if you look at these figures and you see these uh, politicians mouthing pieties about how they care about climate change, you just have to say, you know, you guys are just frauds. They're just absolute frauds. I mean, they don't mean a word, they say. What they're really fighting over is global domination. And if, if people can't recognize that, I mean, they've just closed their eyes. You know, what else can you say? Good morning, Ms. Gosh. Um, I remember a beautiful page in The Great Derangement where you wrote, um, uh, you wrote about future generations that are looking back at us, they will contemplate the future of imagination uh, via V um, um, climate um, problems, environment, the inability to write um, constructively about that. And your target, if I remember correctly, were writers, writers, fiction writers, but especially poets. Um, I was wondering that in the meantime, um, environmental theme has become so common, also in poetry, especially in British and American poetry. I was wondering, in, you, in your view, has something changed? Have poets or fiction writers done something constructively um, to cope with um, in climate change and environmental problems, which have been increasing in recent years? Thank you. Uh, I think it's absolutely true that uh, there's been a huge, uh, you know, outpouring of uh, environment-centered writing in recent years. I mean, that's certainly true. I mean, I myself, I receive uh, so, so many manuscripts every week, you know. Uh, people write to me and say, on my public website, they write and say, oh, your books uh, have really inspired me. So I'm sending you my book and you have to read it. And it's, of course, impossible to read all the books that are sent. Uh, and I think this has been especially the case in um, uh, in poetry. There's been a huge change. In, and as you say, a lot of British and American poets have responded in this way. But I think, uh, you know, people would say that Leopardi uh, was writing uh, environmentally centered uh, uh, poetry a long time ago. Uh, I think people would say Rilke was doing the same thing, you know. So, uh, I, uh, you know, these traditions have existed always and certainly in India if I think of uh, uh, the writers of the let's say mid 20th century uh, and I'm talking about writers who wrote in uh, Indian languages like Bengali and Kannada and Oriya and so on many of them at that point wrote um, uh, uh, you know novels uh, about, that were very much centered on the lives of people in the forests, on, uh, you know, on environmental issues, you know. Uh, unfortunately, that is the strange thing that has happened. If you go and look at the work of uh, younger Indian writers since, let's say, the 1990s, the themes are almost exactly the same as in Western writing. You know, they're overwhelmingly urban, overwhelmingly centered on issues of identity. Uh, so what has happened is that, you know, from about 1990 onwards, you have the Washington Consensus, <laughs> you know, which creates a certain kind of mentality, a certain kind of imaginary. And that imaginary has literally swallowed the whole world, you know, including the global south. So, yes, I do think that there has been a lot of uh, important environmental writing in recent years, but that seems surprising only I uh, in relation to, let's say, the writing of the 1990s and early 2000s. In fact, if we look back to earlier periods, a lot of the writing was exactly that.
Hi, thank you very much. I'm Tommaso Sbricoli, and uh, I would like to start with the title uh, Hungry Tide, because I think it has been badly translated into Italian, uh, the country of uh, tides, while <laughs> it shows what your point about the uh, agency of non-human uh, beings, in this case, even a uh, natural phenomenon who, uh, by being hungry, makes also tigers and humans angry, and so activate all these uh, uh, all, all these sets of your your book. And and, and speaking about uh, uh, hunger, uh, I'm an Indian anthropo an anthropologist of India, <laughs> and um, I've always been fascinated by the fact that uh, grammatically in India you have emotions that are not coming from inside but uh, from outside. So muje uh, or so I'm uh, uh, you say. E a me la fame viene, e mi, mi si attacca la fame, o mi arriva la rabbia. E, and this shows uh, how the, the subject is actually intended and understood in different ways. And I was wondering, my question is, uh, how can we imagine the, the agentivity of non-human beings, the agency of non-human beings, if we don't know, if we don't, don't at the same time make the subject explode? So, sh shall we... Um, mustn't we act actually on the subject, on the idea of an individual bounded uh, person, uh, in order to really make people understand what it means to uh, connect in a different way to, to the environment or to non-humans uh, agents? Thank you. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think it's absolutely true that uh, one of the very interesting features uh, of, uh, let's say, Hindi is exactly this, that, uh, you know, uh, you don't make yourself uh, the owner of your own em emotions or feelings. Often they come from the outside. And I think that's a very interesting sort of, um, uh, how should I say, uh, of causation. Uh, as for the uh, translation of the title, The Hungry Tide, uh, Il Paese del Mare, uh, I, I think... Uh, you know, my translator, Anna Nadotti, who has been my translator, uh, you know, for now for, uh, I think, 35 years or something, and she understands my work as well as, as, as anyone, I would say. Uh, Anna and I had a long back and forth about this. You know, we uh, talked about it a lot, I mean, about how to translate the title. Uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in Bengali, uh, this, uh, this area, the mangrove forest, uh, is usually spoken of as the tide land or the land of tides, you know? Or it's spoken of often as the land of 18 tides, Athirobhatit Desh, you know? So I myself had actually thought of calling the book the land of 18 tides. She, we couldn't find together uh, a, a more sort of uh, literal translation of the hungry tide in Italian. Can you think of one? Uh, I don't know. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> ah, I, I must tell Anna that. Yeah, I think she thought of uh, La Marea Affamata, but then she said uh, again. So similarly with the great derangement, you know, after much, uh, after much uh, discussion, uh, she said uh, derangement has no, uh, she said derangement has no appropriate uh, uh, equivalent in Italian, uh, you know. Uh, so, you know, we, we really, actually it's strange uh, how many words uh, you can't really directly translate into Italian, like uncanny, for example. You know, uncanny really has no perturbante, uh, but it's not the same thing in a way, uh, you know. So, I think with these things you have to trust your translator. You have to trust their judgment. So that's why we decided to go with that title. <laughs> Io parlo come studentessa e ho molto apprezzato in realtà che si parlasse dell'università come appunto un luogo che fino ad adesso, soprattutto in tante università di tutto il mondo, eh, si sia universalizzato, no? tendendo quindi ad omologare, tendendo a praticare dei meccanismi che fanno parte di dinamiche colonialiste, di dinamiche imperialiste e a noi come studenti a scuola, all'università ci è sempre stata detta una cosa, no? ovvero che l'educazione, la scuola, i docenti devono essere neutrali, 
che l'educazione è neutrale e penso che comunque soprattutto negli ultimi anni gli studenti e le studentesse si stiano sempre più coscientizzando, no? rendendosi conto che in realtà l'educazione non è neutrale, l'educazione è fatta per prendere posizione, il sapere è fatto per prendere posizione e noi come giovani in questo momento viviamo in una condizione di precarietà assoluta, ma non solo dal punto di vista lavorativo, quanto anche ad esempio sociale, no? quindi dal punto di vista dei legami, dei rapporti interpersonali, del, dell'individualismo che viviamo e in tanti pensano che quindi l'università non stia più svolgendo quello che doveva essere il suo ruolo originario quindi quello di non soltanto riempire persone del sapere ma portarle ad un pensiero critico allo sviluppo di relazioni interpersonali di legami duraturi, critici e di quella che viene chiamata la contaminazione lo scambio no? che poi è essenziale all'interno dell'università secondo lei quindi l'università sta svolgendo il suo ruolo originario, il suo ruolo sociale, il ruolo sociale che anche i docenti e il sapere dovrebbero avere o si sta sempre più arroccando diciamo, nell'accademia come palazzo di cristallo dove chi detiene il sapere fonda anche dei poteri? Ecco, grazie. Thank you, very interesting question. Uh, I think you've absolutely put your finger on it. Uh, I think, in fact, the client, the, well, to go back to what you were saying uh, to begin with, uh, absolutely, the universities have long served uh, as, uh, you know, a form, uh, the, the locus for producing kinds of knowledge that reinforced colonialism, that reinforced imperialism, and it has done so over centuries. I mean, knowledge is power, you know, as, um, as we know, and universities have been deeply, I mean, you can't even say complicit. They, they are the places that have produced this knowledge. You know, anthropology, for example, has been so much involved in producing certain kinds of colonial uh, and imperialist knowledge. And we see that tension absolutely playing out to this day, uh, especially around, let's say, the planetary crisis. While we are talking about certain kinds of sustainability, you know, you're encouraged to think about those things. But as soon as it veers over into any uh, question of geopolitics, every, every kind of uh, a free thinking or free speech is banned. You know, as we've seen in these last two years, you can only have one position on all these geopolitical issues, you know. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I think for all of us, it's really been a, a profound unveiling of the structures of power that, are, that underlie the university, uh, under by what we might call liberal structures of knowledge. You know, that goes without saying. But again, I do think that, uh, you know, the planetary crisis as we see unfolding today, it's a very, very major challenge uh, to the forms of knowledge that universities, are, uh, you know, disseminate. If you ask me, the single most important thing that a university to, can do today is to say to students, the world that our teaching comes out, out of no longer exists. That world doesn't exist. Universities should be teaching you how to deal with the world, the disrupted world of the future. I see no signs that any university anywhere uh, you know, is posing this question seriously to itself, to its students. And you can't, it's easy to understand why they can't do this, because these things, uh, the unraveling of our world is happening so fast that in a sense it's difficult to keep up. But one positive sign uh, is that many universities are now adopting, uh, you know, curricula in environmental humanities. Kafoskari has been a leader in this. Uh, and I see, you know, this is the fastest growing branch of study uh, in Britain. Uh, Sweden has three or four uh, departments of environmental humanities. But as far as I know, in Italy so far, there is only Kafoskari. No? Ah, you have. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know. Sorry. 
Let's read the question on the, the militant writer. Uh, alcuni ritorna allo scrittore militante, uh, alcuni autori scrivono di temi che riguardano il pianeta, però la maggior parte sembra estranea agli effetti del neoliberismo sulle nostre vite. Si crea un distacco tra autori e pubblico. Is, is this a time of militant writers or the ivory tower with writers? stuck within uh, well there are many militant writers today i mean of course uh, there are there are many writers who are very engaged with political issues of all kinds um, uh, my uh, compatriot uh, arundhati roy is a very great example of that she has been writing very programmatically and very powerfully about these issues for a long time and she's now facing Uh, prosecution by the uh, by the state and there are many writers elsewhere who are also doing this you know when I first started publishing my books uh, I used to see that uh, you know Western critics would write about them you know th in the reviews they would say oh these poor third world writers they always have to write about politics and stuff like that you know because it was assumed that western writers only wrote about personal issues you know but that has so completely changed today ever since donald trump came to power american writers can't think about anything else <laughs> you know <laughs> they're also a part of the whole trump derangement syndrome so this is one of the changes that's uh, that uh, has certainly occurred that we see in the world grazie molto eh, ringrazio eh, l'ultima parola al rettore io ringrazio Amitav Ghosh ringrazio moltissimi colleghi ringrazio la platea eh, abbiamo ascoltato molte domande interessanti molte risposte interessanti non definitive perché queste sono grandi domande e quindi diciamo, abbiamo tutti diciamo, cibo per, 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 per il food for thought diciamo. e, se abbiamo voglia come spero di proseguire in questo ascolto e in questo dialogo eh, ci vediamo tutti eh, la mattina di giovedì alle 11 per ascoltare di nuovo Amitav e la sua Lezio Magistralis in rettorato. Celebreremo e ascolteremo la sua Lezio Magistralis in quella mattinata e la laudazio e, e, la, e la motivazione da parte del Dipartimento. Quindi davvero vi aspetto tutte e tutti e, e, e quanti si vorranno eh, aggiungere a, a questo gruppo la mattina del, del 4 luglio. Poi, siccome ho saputo che Uh, Amitav Ghosh eh, si immergerà nel, nel del palio nel, in questo fenomeno antropologico chiamato palio che esiste a Siena da uh, qualche secolo mi faceva piacere fargli dono di un, di un volume che spero uh, gli dia ulteriori indicazioni e informazioni su questa esperienza uh, di vita uh, di popolo di popoli che vive il palio in questi giorni grazie